Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit effectv.com. Hello world, you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. The current crisis splitting Qatar from the rest of the Arabian Gulf monarchies has its roots deeply embedded in the past. Tribal rivalries between influential Arabian Gulf families made rich by abundant oil and gas deposits has a key role in this crisis. For Qatar, it's oil, but particularly its extremely rich natural gas resources, the largest in the world, has provided the small sheikhdom with a mechanism to move out of Saudi Arabia's strategic orbit. Saudi Arabia, being the largest of the Gulf monarchies, has sought to dominate the Gulf states through the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC, ensuring that all smaller Gulf states comply to its strategic view of the world. Qatar has rebelled against this expectation. Using its gas wealth, it has studiously built up its own relationships with larger powers, notably Iran and Turkey, to hedge against neighbouring Saudi Arabia. The Qatari ruling Al Thani family, having seen Saudi Arabia as a threat to its internal stability ever since Riyadh backed a failed coup to topple the emir in 1996, who himself toppled his father in a bloodless coup the year before, and who has never forgotten Riyadh's capacity to reach deep within Doha's political establishment. Qatar's backing of the Palestinian organization Hamas, southern Lebanese Hezbollah, Various Iraqi Shia groups aligned with Iran have been seen by the other Gulf monarchies as encouraging Iranian expansion and therefore backing an existential threat to the monarchies themselves, as well as to Sunni Islam, especially the Wahhabist variant. Qatar's long-held relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood has also been heavily criticised by the other Gulf states, all seeing this group as fomenting rebellion against the Arabian Gulf's political status quo ante. In 2014, diplomatic ties between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and the UAE were severed for eight months owing to Doha's endorsement of former President Obama's nuclear deal with Iran, Saudi Arabia's strategic rival and sectarian enemy. Complicating this further is the fact that Qatar hosts the US Air Force's Regional Air and Space Command facilities at the Al Udaid Air Base, with some 10,000 US personnel located in this country, and with Qatar now cut off from the rest of the Gulf, how will the U.S. sustain its presence there? Furthermore, with Turkey and Iran openly showing support for Qatar, has the Rubicon been crossed? Will Qatar become the locus of a military conflict that could tear the Arabian Gulf apart? To discuss this, we are honoured to be joined today by Dr. Imad K. Haab, Director of Research and Analysis at the Arab Centre, Washington, D.C., and who is also a member of the SIA Advisory Board. Hi, Imad. Welcome back to Strategicon. Hi, thank you. Imad, uh, regarding the current Arabian Gulf crisis between Qatar and the rest, is the age of Gulf consensus over between the Gulf monarchies? Excellent question. Um, very, very tough to answer. The, uh, but, uh, but the problem, the way the, the things are developing now, it's, uh, it doesn't really uh, augur very well for, uh, for Gulf unity or Gulf unity of action. Uh, you know, these, uh, these, these countries, you know, uh, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and UAE uh, seem to really be very, very going very, very roughly and very tough on uh, on Qatar. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, this whole thing is simply not needed. Uh, I don't think that, um, that the accusations uh, are necessarily uh, accurate. Uh, I don't think that uh, that they are being really fair. Uh, I think they probably uh, are going a bit too fast, too far, um, uh, trying to uh, 
accomplish much more than they think they can uh, or uh, in reality what what can actually be accomplished um, I think the the original problem is uh, uh, rivalries obviously between the different royal families uh, but yet at the same time it's also some of them are trying to really uh, destroy the other royal families it's not like they're trying to change their behavior they're trying to really destroy them and sometimes you think that uh, you know is this whole thing uh, because they wanted to stage some sort of a coup some sort of a uh, regime change in, uh, in Doha and uh, you wonder sometimes about uh, the tactics they are using uh, the uh, the story they are they are telling and uh, sometimes you feel like they're it's, it's all concocted out of uh, you know things lost it's, it's like there's nothing there because uh, the the stuff that they are talking about the the accusations that they are leveling against Qatar uh, it's like it, it's it doesn't deserve so much animosity it doesn't deserve so much bad blood I mean you know uh, you do not just you know it's 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 uh, this is another state that is in alliance with you you don't just simply uh, put it under siege you know cut diplomatic relations and isolate it from the world at least the uh, the, uh, the 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 land route uh, of it and uh, and just uh, tell them okay you either do what we want you to do or uh, or just uh, you know start to death or something of that nature so it's i think it's just a bit too much i think that the uh, the big three sisters are uh, not doing very well by the small one. Imad, from how I understand it, it, the issue really comes down to sovereignty in the Gulf Arab context. Right. So why is Qatar so independent? And will the Gulf Cooperation Council or the GCC bring it to heel? Well, for the, for the, the, the last part of the question, I, it's, uh, I think it's a tall order. Uh, I think Qatar, uh, and because uh, of, the, of the following answer. The following answer has to do with the way Qatar has devised its foreign policy. Uh, and uh, Qatar's foreign policy has been this way since basically the 1990s. Uh, and it has to do with the, with the regime change that occurred in 1995. Uh, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa al Thani uh, basically had a palace coup uh, against his own father, uh, who was a friend of, the Saudi, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. And um, so uh, right there and then, he basically burned his bridges with Saudi Arabia, at least. Um, uh, but yet at the same time, he followed a foreign policy based on soft power, but also based on a calculation called strategic hedging. And so in, in, uh, according to strategic hedging, small states, especially capable small states like Qatar is financially capable, small states seek out different allies, many, many different mm -hmm. allies, just in case one ally is not good for you, or just in case one ally is trying to uh, subsume you, uh, so to speak, under your under uh, his or her own uh, 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 tutelage, that uh, what, what he did is he went ahead and struck all kinds of deals, all kinds of uh, political deals, strategic deals, all kinds of uh, uh, friendship uh, agreements. Uh, uh, he interfered around the world, especially in the Arab world. He interfered in different uh, uh, problems, you know, from Chad to, uh, to uh, from Darfur in Sudan to uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia to Yemen to Lebanon. He interfered everywhere. He tried to find a Qatari role so that he would have something else to count on so he would have uh, something that he would he would tell the world that hey listen i am not only confining myself to just simply producing oil and gas and being just simply a rentier state of the gulf i'm also trying to help out in international disputes and by that he is build, he was building up a soft power that he will later call upon to try to help him in uh, crises uh, like the one Qatar is going through now. Uh, uh, in his strategic hedging thing, he, he looked for different allies. He didn't only go uh, with Saudi Arabia and the uh, Emirates. I mean, these are his, uh, I mean, uh, Qatar's, these are Qatar's um, uh, allies, sisters, neighbors within the GCC. Uh, he didn't only depend on them. He also, uh, Qatar also went to 
places like China, places like Japan, places like Africa, places like Turkey, and obviously the United States. I mean, the biggest the biggest deal for Qatar was uh, to open uh, the the Al uh, Air airbase, uh, and uh, which houses now about ten thousand, eleven thousand American soldiers, and it's the only place in the Middle East where uh, you know B fifty twos can fly, and, uh, and these are things that are uh, necessary uh, assets in the wars that uh, the United States has conducted over over the last uh, couple of decades in the area. So uh, a lot of the, of this has to do with how Qatar has been able to cash in what it has of assets to try to have an independent foreign policy and yet at the same time to defend itself from the repercussions of its sister countries and especially Saudi Arabia that are going to be and were and are now uh, a a bit jealous uh, or at the same time uh, wanted to try to uh, have their, their say, so to speak, in Qatari foreign policy. Imad, oh, with regard to developing this hedging policy, it's been claimed that, uh, you know, by those who stand against Qatar at the moment, that Qatar has paid between 200 to 300 million dollars to jihadists in Syria uh, associated with Al-Qaeda in exchange for hostages sought after by Hezbollah and Iran. Uh, Also, that Qatar has allegedly paid $700 million to Iran and Shia proxies in Iraq. Now, you know, these are just claims that have been put out in the public domain. But That's do you correct. do you think that if if there is any truth behind these kind of accusations, that that in itself shows that Qatar has crossed the line in a, in a, in essence, you know, from from its um, neighbors in the Gulf. That is actually true. Uh, these are uh, uh, none of this is yet fully substantiated, and yet at the same time, the Iraqi government is saying that. Hey, we have that money. The money has not been given to any militias or any uh, terrorist groups or anything like that. As a matter of fact, yesterday or the day before, uh, two uh, Qatari officials went and met with the uh, with the uh, uh, Iraqi authorities, uh, Iraqi officials, and uh, and they actually looked at the money in the central bank of Iraq. So the money has not, uh, according to the news that uh, I uh, I looked at. Uh, the money has not really been distributed to any of these groups. On the other hand, there are accusations, and these are accusations I don't think that the Qatari government has fully really uh, refuted. There are accusations of individuals, Qatari individuals, who are uh, involved in paying some money to some factions or some uh, organizations that are uh, that are considered to be terrorist organizations or extremist groups, jihadist groups. But yet, at the same time, I like to also point out that this is not only a Qatari problem, and this is this is a very very important point, and it's almost like you know it's a red herring. I mean, you know, uh, for Saudi Arabia to accuse Qatar of financing uh, terrorist groups or for terrorist individuals for uh, the UAE to do that, you know, all you have to do, all you have to do is just look at the newspapers. I mean, there are news, very very similar news to people in Saudi Arabia and. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, who have done the same the same thing, uh, Kuwait itself has uh, had individuals who are who are involved in uh, in extremist uh, activities and uh, and uh, they they fund extremist groups. So uh, none, I don't think that any of the of the Gulf states, except perhaps perhaps the Sultanate of Oman, uh, are uh, is uh, you know innocent of uh, of this charge. But yet at the same time. Uh, you can also look at uh, what, the, you know, for instance, the United States, what the United States says about this. You know, the United States said that Qatar has really done great work in trying to uh, limit the terrorist financing and trying to uh, cut off uh, relations with uh, anybody's, uh, anybody has, uh, having relations with these groups. Uh, and it said the same thing about other GCC countries as well. So. Uh, the the issue uh, to me it's all it's all a, um, a it's an accusation every everybody has to be to really follow what international law says and you're not supposed to to support any or, or fund any terrorist groups but yet at the same time uh, if we look at one side and not look at the other we're not being really truly uh, truthful about it or or we're not being neutral in the, in the, in the issue there is one 
particular group that the Qataris have had a long association with in terms of backing, and that is the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood is considered a terrorist organization by all members of the GCC except for Qatar. Uh, Furthermore, uh, Khaled uh, Mashal, the leader of Hamas, has safe haven in Doha. Obviously, Hamas is not necessarily considered uh, top of the pops among many people in Washington (laughs) and elsewhere in the region. So um, has, has Qatar sort of created a noose around its own neck by having maintained this sort of relationship with these types of groups and individuals, uh, making it sit outside of the norm, in a sense? Right. Um, Well, this this question requires a little little divvying up, so to speak. We need to divide it into different categories. Number one, the United States does not consider Muslim Brotherhood yet, at least, a terrorist organization. It considers Hamas to be a terrorist organization. On the other hand, GCC states outside of Qatar, other than Qatar, consider the Muslim Brotherhood to be a terrorist organization, but not Hamas to be a terrorist organization. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the situation here is you have, to, you have to differentiate now between the position of the GCC uh, or, or the countries of the GCC other than Qatar and the the position of the United States. If you are blaming Qatar for supporting the Muslim Brotherhood because it is a terrorist organization, then why should the United States be interested in that since it doesn't define the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, right? And vice versa. The issue is the same thing with Hamas. If the United States considers Hamas to be a terrorist organization and GCC countries don't, uh, why are the GCC countries blaming Qatar for hosting Hamas or hosting Hamas leaders? At the same time, Ham- uh, Qatar has not supported and it's not known to be supporting Hamas's uh, uh, military activities. It's known to be supporting the Gaza Strip, where Hamas is a ruler, uh, the, the organization that rules the Strip. And uh, so by, by, that, by, that, uh, by that logic, obviously, it's helping Hamas in its own uh, rulership over the Gaza Strip, but you know, the, you know, the, the, when you get into the details, you start thinking, okay, well, what's going on here? And uh, the, the other detail is, all GCC countries had in the fifties and sixties had the Muslim Brotherhood as the premier social organization, religious organization that helped all GCC countries establish their social systems. Uh, these were new states. The Muslim Brotherhood came in, uh, established their their social systems, especially their their um, uh, their education system, and the Muslim Brotherhood is responsible for that, including Saudi Arabia and Qatar and and uh, Bahrain. On the other hand, Bahrain itself still has its own Salafis, its own Muslim Brothers in Parliament, in their own, in its own Parliament. Same thing with Kuwait. Why is the Muslim Brotherhood a problem? When it's in uh, in in, uh, in Doha, but it's not a problem a problem when it's in Manama or in Kuwait City. So uh, you know, sometimes you feel like I mean uh, it's, it's disingenuous all over the place, disingenuousness all over the place. I, I qualify all of this by saying you know Qatar maybe should just you know just be careful about how it basically brands its support to these organizations. You know the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, is, uh, yes, it's an Islamist organization, but it's not a terrorist organization. I mean, nobody really blamed the Muslim Brotherhood for blowing up anything, except today, um, uh, you know, uh, the the, uh, Egyptian regime considers the Muslim Brotherhood to be, you know, hell on earth, to be be the, uh, you know, uh, devil incarnated. Um, uh, And uh, the GCC countries are using that. I, I think these are all scapegoats, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, uh, uh, Qatar's openness on Iran, all that stuff. These are all red herrings. Uh, the issue is uh, trying to influence the Qatari, fo- Qatari foreign policy that has shown a bit too much independence from uh, GCC policies. Let's take a break here, and when we return, we'll continue our discussion on the latest Qatari crisis in the Arabian Gulf. You're listening to Strategicon the podcast of S.I.A.
And that sample of Gulf Arab music was taken from Music Arabi Khaliji, published on YouTube May 5, 2014. And now we'll return to our discussion on the Qatari crisis. So Imad, what does the current crisis mean for the GCC itself? Will it survive in its current form? How do, you, how do the other smaller Gulf Arab monarchies view Saudi influence in this group? Are they happy to take the lead from Riyadh, or does Qatar's rebellion signal something far deeper among the Gulf states? I, I honestly don't know how far... How, this crisis here is going to affect the GCC for a while. Now, that while is long or short, depends on how the GCC leaders decide to act on, uh, on, on the crisis. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the court is in the uh, the ball is in the Emirati and Saudi court. I think Saudi Arabia, as the big sister of everybody, should decide whether it really wants a uh, a GCC that's strong and united together with everybody participating in decision making, or everybody being just simply. Uh, uh, should basically follow orders, so to speak. Um, uh, I think once that uh, dilemma is resolved, uh, whether you know the GCC is uh, one state with the others following or all states participating in decision making, once that dilemma is resolved and answers to it, good answers, effective answers are found for it, then maybe we can say what the what the what the uh, uh, future of the GCC is going to be like. At the present moment, however, the future of the GCCC is in great danger. Qatar could, uh, has so far not said anything about its membership in the GCC. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Bahrain and uh, the, Emirate, uh, the Emirates have not yet said, oh, okay, we want to expel Qatar, for instance, from the GCC. Um, uh, mind you, I mean, you know, the, the same complaints almost uh, the, regarding Iran is also uh, levied against Oman, but nobody comes towards Oman to, to do anything about it. So obviously there is a rivalry of some sort that uh, that Qatar is representing, and it's representing maybe be representing that rivalry because uh, it's probably uh, being a bit too independent. So GCC leaders have the responsibility right now, and they have had that responsibility for the last 36 years since they established the GCC in 1981. They have not yet established a conflict resolution mechanism within that GCC, within that organization. You cannot have an organization like this without having some sort of a mechanism of this sort that will help ameliorate the problems, that will help try to discuss the problems. And yet at the same time, Alongside that that mechanism, there has to be a recognition within the GCC that these people, that that you know, problems in organizations of this nature are, will always be, uh, uh, unless the, the 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 leaders decide that they are going to allow each other to be to have basically open discussions, uh, to have democratic ruling uh, within the GCC. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it, the GCC is a great organization on paper, but when implementation happens, uh, it, uh, it, it lacks. And that's because the GCC leaders themselves and uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the organization itself is not institutionalized properly. Uh, you know, personalism instead of institutionalization is the norm in the GCC. And if, if you have personalism here, you will always have problems between persons, between different leaders. If you have uh, institutionalization, then it's likely that you will find the mechanisms to try to ameliorate the problems, fix them, and uh, go on from there. What do you think that, <clears throat> that Turkey and Iran's intercession on behalf of Qatar will have on the strategic dynamic of the Gulf? And do you think it's only a matter of time before the Russians see opportunity to get themselves involved? Well, uh, listen, uh, you know, uh, about, about the Russia thing, uh, you know, Russia is looking for any friends anywhere. And uh, especially these days, uh, I mean, you know, uh, the minute uh, uh, President Trump here tweeted about uh, 
that Qatar is responsible for all this. I mean, at the very minute that uh, it was it was known, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin made a uh, you know, place a phone call to the Emir of Qatar. So obviously, he is looking for ways to uh, for uh, breaches, so to speak, to uh, to enter into the GCC, obviously, and and enter anywhere else. By the way, I mean, if he if he can influence things in the GCC, then uh, he might uh, really influence things uh, uh, his way in Syria, because the GCC is probably right now the uh, the biggest uh, uh, obstacle, so to speak, to what he wants to do in Syria. Um, but you know, the the, the, uh, the Russia will always look for places to go. Problem is, how will it be? perceived in the Gulf. I mean, can the Gulf take Russia, in other words? Uh, you know, how will they take Russia? Are they going to take Russia economically? Are they going to take Russia militarily? Can they take Russia militarily? I mean, uh, these are these are states that are, uh, you know, armed to the hilt from the United States of America. I mean, uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, you know about this more than I do. Their, uh, their weapons uh, acquisitions uh, make them really Western allies. I mean, they're, they're uh, and they're not necessarily uh, you know, very very good with uh, with uh, Russian weapons, obviously. So, uh, from the military standpoint, uh, Russia will Russia will probably love to have uh, you know to sell some weapons there, but uh, it's uh, I don't think the GCC is ready or uh, willing to really go the Russia way. Although they may every once in a while use that threat of maybe we have other options uh, uh, and go for, uh, you know, just to basically to scare the United States uh, about certain uh, policy choices in the Gulf. So uh, getting back to Turkey and Iran, uh, we've heard yeah. recently that Turkey wants to deploy military forces uh, in Qatar, and we've seen that uh, Iran wants to send in food shipments. I mean, what, what, does, that, what does that mean? I mean, it, it, from, from an external perspective, from here in Australia, it looks like, you know, positions are hardening, and if Ankara and Tehran were to weigh heavily on what's going on in Doha, the idea of Qatar being able to split itself off from the rest of the GCC seems like a very real prospect, yeah? Well, see, the, the, yeah, yes, uh, that that is true, and this is uh, it's it's just simply. I mean, Qatar, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Iran and Turkey are obviously looking for a foothold. Uh, Turkey has already got the foot, the foothold. I mean, you know, they signed in twenty fifteen an agreement uh, according to which they opened a base and they can you know uh, uh, deploy uh, soldiers up to I think four thousand soldiers or something like that. And, uh, Turkey is doing that, and uh, you know the Turkish parliament just passed legislation allowing uh, the government to send troops to Qatar. And uh, but you know the, the interesting part about the Turkish situation is Qatar is only about one and a half to two billion uh, one and a half to two billion dollars invested in Turkey. Other GCC states, you know, especially Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, have probably something somewhere of uh, close to about probably about like twelve or thirteen billion dollars invested in Turkey, and yet Turkey chose to stand by Qatar specifically because Turkey knew that if Qatar falls, then we're talking about Turkey being alone as the one nation uh, in the Middle East that is supported by or that supports something called the Muslim Brotherhood. So there is something there, right? There is something from the ideational point of view. It's not only economic interest, it's also uh, ideologically, uh, ideological interest. As far as Iran is concerned, uh, what do you expect? Iran is going to look for any breach to enter into the GCC, obviously. Uh, Iran exploits the fact that Oman is open to it, uh, has very good diplomatic relations with Oman, they visit each other and they cooperate economically and all that stuff. Uh, um, and it will, I mean, if, if, if Qatar needs uh, foodstuffs, if it needs uh, tradable goods, yes, it will help Qatar because, uh, and Qatar at the same, at, the, at this time, I don't think Qatar is going to really be choosy about where it gets its food because it's uh, it's in dire uh, in dire straits so to speak um uh, you know the, the interesting part about this also an interesting angle to it that this is this is what what shows you uh, a bit of disingenuousness on the part of this whole thing i mean why did it come come up 
Why is Qatar blamed for being so close to Iran? Uh, although it's not necessarily that close to Iran, but yet at the same time, I mean, Dubai itself, within the UAE, the Emirate of Dubai itself, has has trade of up to ten billion dollars with Iran every year. I mean, you know, why is Dubai allowed to trade with Iran and not not uh, Qatar? Uh, you know, showing a little bit of moderation towards Iran. So this is why I, I go back to the original the original uh, point that. The question is not all these extraneous conditions. The question is the issue of independent foreign policy, independent uh, leadership in, uh, in Qatar that's trying to do something that maybe Saudi Arabia or, or the Emirates are not happy with. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, another one could be, and this is something that was revealed in the uh, in the leaked emails of the of the uh, Emirati ambassador to the United States. Uh, Yusuf Lo that you know maybe uh, uh, Emirates is interested in Lo being opened in the UAE instead and closed in Qatar. So uh, if that's the case, then the best way to do it is to get the United States really mad at Qatar and respond by pulling out, pulling its air base out. So uh, well, uh, coming back to that very point, I mean, how will this conflict um, affect U.S. personnel operating within Qatar? Will Washington be forced or convinced to relinquish its presence at uh, the, the al Udaid air base? And what can the Trump administration do uh, with regard to moderating uh, the, the conflict? Because with Trump's recent visit to the Gulf, you know, it has already thrown in its lot with the Gulf states standing against Qatar, hasn't it? Yes, uh, but see, this is, this is something that yeah, this is new to uh, you know uh, uh, America watchers, so to speak, Washington watchers. Uh, we have not had uh, uh, a presidency or an administration in which the president is so far, uh, uh, so far from the beaten path, so to speak, of, of American traditional foreign policy. Uh, uh, a, the, the, uh, president Trump is. Uh, is uh, just beating the drums of something that uh, that is so anathema, so different from traditional American foreign policy, uh, that he is actually uh, having basically policy disputes, policy, policy discord within his administration, and specifically with his Defense Department and his uh, State Department. And uh, this is uh, uh, what we talk about al Odeid Air Base. We, we should also keep in mind that relations with Qatar, as far as I'm concerned, relations with Qatar are more military than they are anything else. And it is because al Odeid Air Base is there. And moving, as, as you, you, you're a military analyst, you know that moving an air base, this, this can take 10 years. You can't take it. You can't move an air base like, like, like this one easily or quickly so the united states right now in the middle east and in the in the wider region is in dire need for a base like this to close that base and try to establish another base elsewhere i mean there goes its war on terrorism in the, in the area. That go, there goes its war on isis or al-qaeda or anything like that so it's to me uh, closing the dead air base is very very far-fetched I, I don't think it will ever happen, uh, considering also that the Defense Department, when this whole thing started, the Defense Department said, hey, 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 we have nothing to do with this. We don't want this to happen. We want the GCC states to stay together. Qatar is doing what it can do, and it's helping, and it's uh, actually a, a source for stability in the region. Uh, the, uh, the State Department, in fact, uh, just simply uh, endorsed that specific statement from the Defense Department, saying that the GCC states should not have any discord between them. They should be. They should agree on on these principles. And uh, nobody is talking about moving a low date or anything like that. The problem is, generally speaking, the problem with American involvement there is in the White House. The president does not, in all honesty, and this is I'm, I'm very very unfortunately uh, saying this. The president does not have the knowledge necessary to make very complicated and very sophisticated decision about decisions about this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody said a couple of uh, days ago, that no, actually a week ago, that he actually didn't even know that the Laudate Air Base is in Qatar. I mean, 
mean, uh, uh, which, what, what, what president would say what he did if he knows that 10,000 of his soldiers are situated in that country? So uh, it's, it's, uh, this is why I'm, uh, I, I honestly, do, I, I don't mean no disrespect to the American president, but I don't think he's really qualified to make decisions of this sort. And if he's not qualified, I think it's going to be left to the cooler heads, the more experienced heads, and the basically the uh, the institutions with the uh, with the depth, with the no- depth of knowledge, depth of experience in the area, which is which are the uh, State Department and Defense Department to make that decision. With the nature of the chaotic situation that we see in Washington D.C. at the moment, I mean, can the U.S. help resolve this crisis since they're kind of part of the crisis rather than sitting apart yeah. from it? So, you know, where do you see? Uh, the, the the point at which the United States can actually intervene to help manage this issue. I think what it can is it can it can reinvigorate the Kuwaiti reconciliation effort. Uh, you know, Kuwait uh, the Emir of Kuwait tried, and uh, uh, for the last five six days he hasn't gone anywhere. He hasn't done anything, which means that he he basically failed. Uh, you know, Morocco tried to. Uh, uh, to say, well, uh, try to interfere and uh, said uh, that, uh, you know, we're interested in, inter- in mediating this uh, this conflict. Uh, I personally think that uh, Morocco would not say something like this without talking to Riyadh first, to Saudi Arabia first. Uh, the uh, king of Morocco is not going, to, is not somebody rash who would just say that without discussing it first uh, with Saudi Arabia. So uh, maybe Saudi Arabia is willing to go back from the brink. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Moroccans can help in this. Uh, the Kuwaitis can re-engage themselves in it, and the United States can, should should re-engage it. Uh, should re-engage itself. But at the same time, I think the United States would do well to just take the phone, take the president's phone from his hand, so he doesn't throw more, uh, you know, uh, monkey wrenches at the work, so to speak, yeah. and uh, and allow this mediation to uh, to go through. Because without without uh, an American uh, uh, presence, without America proving that it really can be a friend to everybody and to uh, all GCC states equally, then the United States really loses its uh, itself in the Gulf. And if the United States loses itself in the Gulf, there are many many others who are very very willing to go and uh, get in, uh, get involved in the Gulf and basically supplant the United States there. Uh, Imad, can you please explain to our audience the power of the Qatari news agency Al Jazeera and why it has been so successful at influencing global views about the Middle East? I mean, and embedded within that, of course, is the fact that Al Jazeera has been accused of giving airtime to Saudi dissidents, which I think puts Qatar back in the, into the spotlight uh, in terms of you know, sitting outside of the GCC norm. I mean, how is Al Jazeera seen by the other Gulf monarchies? Well, it's seen as a disruptive force, um, obviously. Uh, aside from its reporting on uh, on you know, some things that uh, that do not necessarily please the Saudis or the Emiratis or the Bahrainis or anybody like that, uh, it is also um, uh, it, it has played a very very important role in. The, uh, the revolutions of the Arab Spring since 2011. So it played a role in making that uh, spring a daily occurrence in everybody's life uh, in the Arab world. So uh, in that sense, it's looked at as a subversive uh, means of uh, subversive media. Um, it's looked at as uh, as a, an agent of change, uh, an agent of change in an area that really does not like change. And uh, change means that uh, the regimes of the Gulf would be to, would be would be toppled, so to speak. And uh, I don't think that the uh, regimes can be toppled or want to be toppled. I don't think that the, um, the governing elites are really willing to do any of the, any of this. And uh, the in, in that sense, the Jazeera becomes a uh, an agent that is a hated agent, an agent of discord, and that's why everybody wants to shut it down. Um, the question is the, the the problem with with all this with all these wishes is that Al Jazeera is very very popular in the Arab world. 
So uh, uh, if Qatar were to close Al Jazeera down because of pressures from Saudi or anywhere else, uh, uh, Qatar would would really lose a very very good uh, uh, media machine that can uh, that that uh, basically carries its message everywhere, and at the same time uh, may may look like it's just as disingenuous and as all the other states, considering also at the same time that Al Jazeera does not talk about issues within Qatar itself. Uh, so. Uh, uh, in that in that sense, so Al Jazeera is, uh, itself is also being a bit disingenuous by not covering the news from its own country. But that's a wrap, and sure. thanks for joining us on this episode of Strategic. Thank Home. you. Thank you. Thanks for for having me. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strategicon through iTunes and SoundCloud, and please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. Also, please comment on any of our articles, podcasts and blogs through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter or SoundCloud, and of course on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. Until next time, goodbye. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.